Back in August, I started a big project with 3D printing. I've always wanted to get a copy of Settlers of Catan. And I went on Amazon, I was ready to buy it. It's like 50 bucks or something like that. It's kind of expensive for a board game. And all the reviews were really bad. It turns out that the newest version of the game is all printed on like cheap cardboard stock and off-center printing usually and cut poorly and just so many complaints. But somebody made these great 3D models on Thingiverse that you could download and you could print out. And it just seemed like such a perfect project to do. So I started printing them. And I told myself I'm going to print them all in the highest quality possible. So each one of these tiles took six hours to print and I have to print a lot of them. <laughs> it took a month to print everything. Finally have it all done. It's all white. All the tiles look like this. And they look great, you know, for what they are. But now I need to paint them. We'll have a link in the description below for these specific tiles if you guys want to go check them out. And big thanks to the creators who made them. Thingiverse is great. It's just such a cool spot for people to like design and make tools or little inventions and then just share them with other people. It's really cool. There's some cool special things about these tiles. And here's the coolest thing. Underneath here, there's always little holes. And you put little buckyball magnets or those little ball magnets in those holes. What's supposed to then happen is that you can stick these together and they go and they snap. Like they don't really hold each other up or anything like that. But there's a very, very light attraction. And the idea is that ball magnets can spin because, you know, there's a north and south side to magnets and you can't lock them in there because you don't know which, which other polarity your magnets will have on the other pieces. So little balls can spin in place to lock themselves together. Uh, when I printed all these though, I printed the whole thing before trying to put magnets into one of them and all the holes were a little too big. <laughs> all the magnets would fall out. I solved it by putting a little bit of wood putty. I could put the magnet in there and put a little bit of wood putty over the top of it. Not like pushing it into the hole, but just covering the top. And then I would take like a, a tool of some sort, like uh -huh. one of those little screwdrivers that you get like with like to fix like glasses or phones or something like that. And I just scrape a little bit off the back off the top. And that'd be enough to kind of like jiggle the, the ball loose. And I actually had a really powerful magnet that I could also then take and kind of like move on the edges to wiggle the ball and break it free from the putty. And after doing so, it worked great. And all these little bucky balls rotate in their sockets, they don't fall out, and the whole thing sticks together. So it's really easy just to like put all the pieces together because they'll all just snap right into place. Done. And trust me, like without the magnets, everything keeps shifting and sliding. It's almost impossible. You can see like right here, I'll just take this piece and whoop, just kind of slides right in there. It's super satisfying. <laughs> Time to do it. I haven't been much of a lens guy for the last few years. I, I respect lenses, but I haven't been very picky about lenses. Uh, previously, for the last few years, we've been using exclusively Canon lenses, just because we, we have a EF mount on the red. It's very convenient. However, lately, we've been shooting a lot in 6K, and now with 8K kind of looming over our heads, we've been experimenting with some higher quality lenses. We have something really special in the studio. We have the full set of Sigma's cinema lenses, and I'm gonna compare them to all the lenses that we are currently using, just to see what the big what the big deal's about. Are our lenses good enough, or have we been using garbage, and these super cool cinema lenses are actually the way to go? Let's figure it out. There's pros and cons to everything, but that's what this experiment is all about. Let me just show you the lenses we're gonna be working with today. 70 to 200, one of my favorite lenses. It's just a great lens. We also have the L-Series 24 Prime. And then just for kicks, we got a 17 to 55, whatever series, I don't know. This is like, this is not your, this is not your grandma's lens test. Get ready, this is Sam's lens test. That's right, no standards, no particular order. No information or technical specs. <laughs> Sam sl <laughs> slapping camera lenses on cameras. Anyways, we end, and then we've got one of Canon's cheapest lenses here, a 50 mil prime. So for the Sigma lenses we're gonna compare, we have six of their cinema prime lenses in here. This is a whopper of a case. Damn. We actually have two more up here. Two of their cinema zoom lenses. I know how much these lenses cost. These are way more expensive way better lenses than anything we are using. So I'm, I'm hoping for some good results. If they don't deliver, I'm gonna be disappointed. Because look at these things. Holy crap. We got like a 135. We, we, have, we have the whole range. Everything except a 50. So that's cool. And then up above here, 18 to 35. We got a 50 to 100. Once again, the only thing I have to compare these two are the Canon lenses that I've been using for years. If their size and weight is and in any way proportional or relative to their quality compared to these other lenses, then I have very high hopes. <laughs> you can buy the game for like 40 or 50 bucks. You print it theoretically for free, well for the cost of plastic. But looking back at it now, I've 
put so much plastic into this and so much time and paint and like buying all the brushes. And I still had to buy the cards from the game pack. You can buy replacement cards. So I had to buy official so there's like a 10 cards. I'm not saving any money. In fact, I'm probably spending more money than it would take to buy the game, but I'm still doing it. When I was really young, I always wanted something like this. You know, these days, maybe my imagination is not quite as uh, boundless as it was when I was four years old, but I think it's good to hold on to a little bit of your youthful attitude, especially if you're in something like art. You're always trying to capture people's wonder and their imaginations and, you know, what could be. If you lose sight of that, you know, if you're too concerned with the day-to-day, -day, and you don't take a moment to think about what it is that catches people's wonder and makes them imagine, then it's gonna be really hard to make art that catches people's wonder and makes them imagine. <laughs> the other thing is, I spend a lot of time on computers, and for some reason in today's culture, everything's getting upgraded, everything's getting updated all the time. Things break constantly because of that. It used to be that you'd upgrade things to fix them, now things are just constantly breaking. <laughs> <laughs> then you sit there and you spend half an hour figuring it out, troubleshooting. And at the end of the day, you just want to create. Like, I just want to do my effects on the computer. I just want to edit. But I end up spending 20% of my time every time I sit down just troubleshooting stuff. But you don't have to troubleshoot paint. You don't have to troubleshoot paintbrushes. There's no glitches. There's no errors. There's no internet connectivity required. There's no DRM. There's no signing in. There's no loss of internet connection. It's just you and the paint and your hands. And it's such like a calming quiet thing to do, to not really be productive for once, just to do something analog, but still make something that captures your imagination that feels like it's art. Yeah. So all my lens tests went really, really well. In fact, they gave me the confidence to take all these lenses and bring just these Sigma lenses out for a shoot. I filmed a whole video with them, and the video looks really, really, really nice. So before I get into comparing, let me show you like some real world examples, what these lenses look like when used on set. My goal here was just to make this look as nice as possible, and these lenses actually helped a lot. First off, these are prototype lenses. They're super cool, they're super fancy. I'm super thankful that we got to use these. That being said, what you're about to see is, and what you're about to hear is all 100% honest. <laughs> Check this out. Out. The first thing I noticed when filming with these is that they are incredibly crisp. What, what, is, what does that mean? What does crisp mean? When you t start taking a look at some of these frames here, you start seeing that like across the image from the farthest pixel on one end of the frame to the other, it is incredibly consistent, minimal vignetting. When you look at that image, you're like, wow, that looks cool. We actually have incredibly minimal lighting here. We're not doing anything fancy on set. I do have a slight color grade applied to it. Let me uh, flip that on and off here so you can see very minor shift. I mean, obviously it does help a little bit, but I'm not doctoring the image by any means. Literally all we have in this scene is a tiny light. We have literally one light panel, a one aperture LED light in the scene. That is the only like production light. But when you look at this frame, you can tell there is a, a certain amount of sharpness and clarity to the image. This is the kind of stuff I'm starting to notice with these lenses. It's something subtle. Uh, and that's that's the big thing with these lenses here. It's like they give you those improvements that that bump the quality of your piece from something you'd see shot on a normal DSLR to something you would imagine seeing blown up on a theater screen or on your big screen TV at home. It's stuff that holds up to that amount of scrutiny and level of detail. So I've been painting these for a while, working in the forest now. There's actually a really cool technique I learned. So when you're painting miniatures, trying to do details is really, really hard, but miniatures also lend themselves to a technique called dry brushing. And dry brushing is basically where you just put a little bit of paint on a brush, and then you utilize the texture of a surface to pull that paint off the brush. You can see it here in these mountains, for example. So if you look closely up here, you can see these little grooves of snow and rock. And that, that's created by dry brushing, is you just take the brush and you lightly hit the surface of it, and just those little raised edges catch the paint. And I'm actually gonna be doing dry brushing on this forest here to give myself fall colors. Grab a little bit of orange, you wipe it off the brush so it's not very thick, and then you just take it, and you lightly sweep the surface. And what's gonna happen is the raised parts of your model are going to catch the paint, and the lowered parts of the model won't have the brush hit it. You basically bring out the detail, and it's really, really handy, it's really, really easy, and just makes stuff look really good. It's so much easier than like having to paint and selectively hit all the raised parts of a model. You can just brush it with your brush. Consider subscribing to the channel if you are not already subscribed, because we constantly are trying new things and learning new things and sharing that knowledge with you guys. It's a lot of fun. Nico's little Bob Ross corner here. There are no mistakes, just happy little accidents. So these lines look cool. In practice, they were working really well. They're super sharp. The footage looks great. I think this is the best looking video I've ever shot. Pretty good review, right? Now, let's take a look, though, at some of the back-to-back -back comparisons I did so you can see exactly 
what's going on with these lenses versus some of the more basic lenses that we're traditionally using. So I've grouped up all of our lenses here. So let's start with some 24. How about that? That's, that's a good example, I think. We have a bunch of 24 mil lenses that we can really look at back to back. We have our Canon L series, 24 millimeter prime lens. We have our Sigma 24 millimeter prime lens. Just a little flip back and forth. Canon, Sigma, Canon, Sigma. All right, so we can't really see too much just yet. What else do we have on here? We have Sigma's 18 to 35 zoom lens at 24 millimeters. And so let's go back and forth between the prime version of the Sigma versus the zoom. Here we go. Prime, zoom, prime, zoom. Okay, so that's, that's you can see it quickly there. The difference in those two Sigma lenses is already very significant. We do have a little bit of distortion. We have a little bit of vignetting between these two lenses. What's our last one here? What have we got here? Oh yes. Now this is our 17 to 55 lens. This is one of the oldest lenses we have. It's the EFS 17 to 55 mil. Let's go a little more scientific here. I'm just gonna zoom in. I'm gonna blow this up and take a look at the footage at like 400%. This is where you're gonna start to see what's going on here. Uh, now we are zoomed in 400%. We have, so we have our Canon L series prime. We have our Sigma prime, Sigma, Sigma zoom, and 1755 here. So the biggest thing I'm seeing here is that the Canon 24 millimeter L series lens gives everything a slight magenta hue shift. I'm not sure what's going on here, but if you look at the colors here versus the Sigma Prime right here, there is a very stark difference in the color that the lens is getting. And it's crazy to think about this, but through the amount of coatings that go on the glass, like anti-reflection, anti-flare, glare, and then also just simply the physics of light, you won't find that. Lenses do shift the color of your footage. The advantage of these Sigma ones over the Canon so far is that they are giving us much more accurate color. Between the two Sigma lenses, not a huge difference in color. Uh, this is the zoom and you can see there is actually a little bit of a slight purple, bluish, magenta shift once again between the Prime right now. I'd say the, the Prime is still the most accurate for color, but right there, boom, big difference. Between the, this is the Sigma Prime, and that's the Sigma Zoom. Let's go to our 1855. Now this one, this one is straight up suffering from a lack of sharpness. And that's that's like the most basic one. I think that right there outlines what exactly is happening when you're using these higher end lenses versus these ones. More accurate colors. No distortion on the sides of your frames. No vignetting. And last but not least, just simply more sharpness. Those kind of combine to give you that high quality cinematic image that you expect to see in a movie or a great TV show.